So today I'm really excited to share some insights about Chinese millennials, um, as well as the mobile trends that we've seen in China and Asia as well. The agenda today will be Chinese millennials. Um, I'll speak about mobile messengers from Asia, um, Chinese social media. I'll have examples from WeChat and also talk a little bit more about global implications because it's not just relevant um, for uh, people in Asia or people who have Asian tourists or Chinese tourists, um, but I think what we see in Asia is causing a huge ripple effect um, in the next stage of social media evolution um, and the new types of social media and digital platforms that we'll see and we have already seen developing. So we'll first take a look at Chinese millennials um, and I wanted to start off with kind of a couple stats. So this is a stat for the Netherlands. Um, so millennials make up about 16% of the population um, at 2.7 million. Pretty sizable, right? Um, China is 28%, um, about 382 or like a billion. So it's, it's a lot of people. Um, so this is just giving kind of um, uh, a kind of a, a benchmark of these are the types of numbers that we're speaking of, um, but I also talk about you know um, why the trends that we see uh, in China and Asia are really relevant for you guys here. Um, whether or not you deal with Chinese consumers, tourists, colleagues, clients now, or you will in the future. So, um, speaking a little bit more about Chinese traveler statistics. Now, I'm sure you guys have seen the growing number of Chinese tourists as well as Chinese students um, to uh, the Netherlands. Um, but by 2019, a significant number of tourists will be Chinese millennials, uh, much, much younger. Um, and with a younger subset of travelers, there's going to be different habits, different platforms that they use, which is quite reflective of um, the millennial demographic already. And so I wanted to share a little bit about uh, the traveler profile um, and that we're in a very unique point in Chinese history but also uh, Chinese millennials now um, and I have a couple descriptions you know they're a new generation they have strong wanderlust they're entrepreneurial it's collectivist individualist and very very experience driven and as you can see from this some of these are very applicable to, you know, general millennials because at the end of the day, you know, I, I kind of joke and I say, you know, we're all humans still. <laughs> and so we're much more similar than we are different. Uh, and so to elaborate a little bit more, now Chinese travelers are very, Chinese millennial travels are very different from other millennial travels because of historical and cultural implications. Um, this is the first generation that has really experienced wealth. Um, China, um, the overall population for many, many decades was very impoverished um, and, you know, in some ways really fell um, behind in, in the 50s. 60 years or so, and now it's a resurgence of, you know, economy and um, globalization and really kind of like shining and being on the global stage. Um, and so there's a lot of reconciliation happening in terms of culture and who we are in the world because Chinese government is really pushing like, no, like we're still, um, you know, communist, like capitalist or socialistic communist tendencies, um, but very much so like on the ground. Living in Shanghai, uh, it feels uh, very capitalist, especially in Shanghai. You know, every single city in the world, and that holds true in China, has their own kind of stereotypes um, of the type of people that live there. And Shanghai is much more modern and much more materialistic um, than other cities. And so when, when I'm in Shanghai and traveling throughout China and Asia, you really do feel that, the emphasis, the importance of having things and saying you have things, but, but also having experiences as well. And so, you know, I, I want to emphasize this because it is very different. So, you know, as a millennial, um, I am one, um, and you're already trying to ex figure out who you are as a person, but Chinese millennials, it's compounded to the point that as a, as a culture, a general culture, there is a bit of confusion of where we stand in the world. Are we going to be more communist? Are we going to be more um, capitalistic and trying to find, you know, where is that happy medium? Um, and they also travel a lot more in terms of international travel. Um, and in some ways, the younger you are, the more inter international travel you will be doing because if you are a family with um, good means, most of them will be educated abroad. 
um, and the top markets are the United Kingdom, um, Australia, and the United States. So this is a trend that even more people, even more millennials, are getting educated abroad and have these experiences, and are also just, you know, if they're in the UK, they're definitely coming to Amsterdam. They're definitely coming to France. They're going to Italy. They're going all over. Um, and they're also quite entrepreneurial, um, just because they have seen and, and experienced the, the digital boom in kind of um, the last 20, 30 years when China opened up. There's just been a lot of new businesses starting, so that is the life that they know. Um, and especially they've seen the success of um, Alibaba, Tencent, Sina. These are all internet companies that have really just started. Um, we look at um, Xiaomi, which is an electronics company, but really spreading itself to other areas. Um, not just smartphones, but also um, wearable technology um, and other electronics used in the home. And they are valued at almost uh, 45 to 50 billion USD, uh, which is incredibly high. And they, they see that and they're like, I can do this too, or I want to do this as well. Uh, and they are becoming much more opinionated as well because um, Chinese culture is very collectivist, and what that means is very community driven. Um, it's less about the individual, more about the group. But as you know, globalization is happening, and they see um, what other cultures are like, and especially consumerism is very focused on you, what you look like, what you should be buying, what you should be doing, they're becoming much more independent, but not to the same point and in the same ways as, a, as their Western counterpart, um, but nevertheless. Uh, independent and, and becoming more free thinking as well. Um, and when they travel, they find that experiences are really important. And experiences are more important to them because they can also show their friends and family and saying, oh, this is what I've done. Um, and, and there's also kind of like FOMO and envy about that as well. And so after that long, you know, kind of description of, you know, why you know, what, what are Chinese travelers and Chinese um, millennial travelers about? You know, why is this important for the Netherlands? And there are three points that I'd like to make. The first one is education. Um, you have a lot of Chinese study abroad students here, or even here for the entire college undergraduate or graduate term. Uh, tourism. Um, in 2014, there are 250,000 tourists. It was an 18% increase from the previous year. Um, but in 10 years, it's estimated that 800,000 a year will come through. Um, so that is a huge growth. And whenever you have a significant foreign population coming into the city on a consistent basis, it will change and shape your economy in ways that you cannot imagine now, um, unless you have been to China and, and, and have had this experience in going around and seeing how things function. Um, and then, of course, economy. You know, President Xi Jinping has said that uh, the Netherlands is China's gateway to Europe. Uh, and there are over 450 companies that have opened offices, branches in the Netherlands. These are, this is information and statistics I didn't know until I started researching um, for this presentation. So you can see, you know, there will be um, not only short-term, but long-term effects in, in all areas of life and all areas of business. Um, and so that's why is relevant for you not only today but also the future as well. Um, it's neither a bad thing, a good thing, it's just something that is going to be happening. And so mobile messengers, and I'll explain this in more in depth later, is, is, is the way, main way of communication. Um, and I think the new age of social media, the new um, stage of evolution really starts um, in China, in Asia. So I'll do um, an explanation of mobile messengers first and kind of what we see in the region and really go a little bit more specific into um, one app in particular, WeChat. So what are mobile messengers? And that's WhatsApp, that's Viber, um, that's uh, WeChat, Line, Kaka Talk. It combines everything that you do into one. WhatsApp is the most basic of all the messenger apps. Um, it could become very advanced in the future. Um, we don't know. Um, but the ones that we see in Asia are very, very comprehensive. It's the app you have open every minute of the day, and you check every minute of the day as well. And the best way I can describe it is the digital engine. It is what Google has always wanted to do, but couldn't catch up fast enough in terms of mobile 
um, uh, UX, user design, um, and also social media. Because you've seen the Google Plus, you've seen the other things they've tried to do, and it's always been like, Mm, that was a nice try, but it's really not going to get anyone signed up. Uh, and so it's something I think that Google has tried to do, but it's unable um, because so much of what we do, what we do on the on the computer, um, revolves around Google, right? A lot of information as well. Um, but it's somewhere where you can buy plane tickets, um, you can order lunch, you can speak to your friends. Um, I get a lot of. Um, messages from my client asking me, oh, I have a question about this, I have a question about that. It's a very much so a blended lifestyle. Everything happens within this app, um, but also all the different people that you need to speak to in your life are also on this application as well. Um, how, how is payment uh, organized? Because I can yes. imagine not everybody has a credit card in, uh, in China yet. No. Um, and so I will speak a little bit more about statistics um, so you can get a better grasp of um, how many people are on this platform, how many people could potentially be on this platform in a little bit, and also speak a lot more about mobile payments because it is the reason why it has transformed uh, this app to be just from a social media app to one that is like a digital life engine. So what, what you're saying is that the payment part uh, uh, did is the, is the secret from uh, what uh, Google is looking for with Google Plus. Well, they did. Well, they did do um, like Google Shopping and they had Google um, check like cart shopping cart and yeah. stuff, and it did seem like it was becoming successful. Uh -huh. But then I think the mobile the mobile boom hit, and they weren't able to do that quickly enough um, because if you can think of it this way, uh, a lot of the a lot of the the platforms we use today are PC origin. And people are sometimes argue with me with Twitter, for example. They're like, "Oh no, but Twitter is really mobile, and you know it's like real time." And I'm like, "Well, when Twitter came out, like it was like the beginning, and it was people using BBM and like BlackBerry, um, and at the very start of iPhone, um, versus like a Yik Yak or a Snapchat or a WeChat that came like many many years after. So it's it's a different." Um, uh, user interface. There's so much more you see in Facebook and it's only this year that they've really made, or last year, that they've made the mobile app much more easily digestible. But even at that point, you know, there's a lot of information. So you can imagine all the mobile apps now, like you look at Facebook compared to Instagram, compared to WhatsApp. The, Facebook is the most complex. And then you have Instagram and that's, that was like one of the, the first truly mobile apps. Um, design for mobile. They, I mean, they didn't even have like a website where you could see Instagram photos until like literally two years ago. Um, so you can see how how different that is. So WeChat Line and Kakao Talk. Um, you know, WeChat's from China, Line's from Japan, and Kakao Talk's from South Korea. They are, have much more advanced features because who uses WhatsApp? Okay, so everyone uses WhatsApp. Does anybody use any of these? <laughs> so, you know, what, WhatsApp, you just kind of like chat with friends, you have big group chats, um, it's, you, you can't buy anything uh, through WhatsApp. Um, there's, there's barely like a, a search functionality to it. Um, there is, there's a special place um, in these applications, specifically when I talk about WeChat, um, there's a special place where you can go for your mobile wallet. Um, you can send money to people, um, you can pay for things, there's mobile commerce um, portals uh, within the application, uh, you can do some wealth management. Uh, within the application, you can top up your mobile phone bill, um, you can donate to charity. Uh, there's lots of different things that you can do that you cannot do within WhatsApp. But the ironic part is that, um, do, you, you guys know about the website BuzzFeed, right? So BuzzFeed, a couple years ago, realized that WhatsApp was becoming quite popular. Or rather, it was just when Facebook bought WhatsApp, and so they added a share this on WhatsApp button um, to all or many of their web pages. And what they saw was a dramatic increase in spike in numbers of, of shares because everyone's viewing stuff through mobile, but all the things, the first share is like share by email. You know, and it takes a bit of a while. Um, whereas you can share this one link to the article to a, a big group of friends from like university or people from work. And they saw that being one of the most popular ways to share versus any other platform or, or, or email. 
um, and so it is it is it is very popular, um, and so it's it's I think in a couple of years WhatsApp will or even this year hopefully they'll add even more features. But at this point, when you compare WhatsApp to any of these three, it's very rudimentary. It's like dial-up versus like like LAT, like 4G. Yeah. And so you can also see the the number of monthly active users. Uh, WhatsApp, of course, because it was very um, early on, uh, they have a lot more global users. Um, but WeChat is really catching up as well. Um, but the thing about WeChat is that most of the people on it are Chinese or who live in China. Um, whereas Line also has a lot of international users as well, and Kakao Talk is mainly uh, uh, focused on in South Korea. Um, but they are also trying to expand internationally as well, um, and they do that through uh, celebrity endorsements, um, specifically football. Um, really getting unique content on branded account uh, branded accounts within these uh, uh, applications so you can get you know these fun emojis fun stickers news that you wouldn't be able to get through their normal social platforms um, and also throwing a lot of money at, at um, celebrity endorsements so you can join uh, and kind of see what's happening as well. Line is one of the most successful. Um, they have a strong uh, growth in Spanish-speaking countries. In Spain alone, they think they have about 18 million users right now. Um, and so they've really heavily targeted um, Spanish-speaking countries in the past few years for expansion. So then, you know, when, then, then we talk about like, which platform really is the best. Um, and what is it going, and which platform is the best for brands, um, for marketers, for companies. Um, and I do think that WeChat, in terms of the features that it has, is the best. Um, but of course, when we talk about platforms, you know, if the people aren't there, if your audience isn't there, then there's no reason to use it. Um, so it, it all depends on who you want to speak to. But even if you, but even if you, it doesn't have the people that you want to speak to on this platform. Um, you can see a lot of the different features and the developments that will give you an idea of what future apps will look like um, and what kind of a digital utopia will be like. So then I need to speak a little bit more about social media and trying to give you um, an overview of why WeChat has become so popular um, in such a short period of time. Um, there are more mobile internet users than PC. Uh, there's 600 million internet users in China, um, and most of those are already on WeChat. Um, so it's, it's quite huge. Um, there's also room to grow as well. Um, and Weibo is a bit like the Twitter um, that we have there that is um, filled with much more advanced features. But it's a much more push um, rather than pull. You're sending a lot of information out. It's not so easy to find information just because of um, the amount of data that is flowing through this platform. Um, and WeChat came about two years ago in a very different way. Um, of course, it was first chat-oriented, but then it started adding um, a lot more official account capabilities. So as a, as a brand, you're able to open an account um, and speak to people, speak to your fans, your customers um, through the application and provide a, a customer service outlet. Um, and it's a pull because for example, you can message a Heineken account and you can say, oh, what are the opening hours for the Heineken experience? And it pushes that message to immediately to you versus you looking on the internet. And of course, like, the difference is very negligible. It's about like, you know, a couple seconds or a minute or two. But there's just that ease of you sending something and something being sent back to you and you don't need to leave the application where you're chatting with friends. That makes it so easy. Um, but then, of course, WeChat a year ago added um, mobile payments, um, and they first added it with taxi services. Um, and so, like Uber, they had a taxi service that you could order through the app and also pay through the app. Um, but in order to get people onto WeChat, um, they basically threw money at the problem. As a rider, you got money to 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 uh, book and pay, so basically it was almost the entire fare 
of your taxi ride within the city center, where most places people would be going to. And then the driver, to entice him or her to also use the app and get people to pay through it, would also get money for every single ride that they took. So slowly, they started getting a lot more people um, connecting their bank cards and their bank accounts to this app. Um, and then a couple months later, um, they did a very big campaign for Chinese New Year, which is like a Christmas plus Chinese plus New Year's uh, for Chinese people. A very, very big holiday. One of the um, biggest traditions is to exchange red envelopes filled with money. And last year was the first year that they digitized this. Um, billions and billions of dollars were sent. Um, and it was very fun because I could directly send to a person, but I could also send to a group of friends and it would be at random. So once you open kind of the invitation, like open me to get like um, Chinese New Year lucky money, um, not everyone would get the same amount. So let's say I did 100 euro for a group of five of my friends. Some would get two euro, maybe some would get 25 euro or maybe even 75 euro. So that kind of got people very, very excited uh, and it was really fun. There's also a lot more money exchanged because it was fun. I remember seeing a screenshot from an old colleague and she had gotten almost 2,000 euro. 2,000 euro in a couple of weeks of money exchanging because when everyone you know is on the platform and it's fun, like you're exchanging like, oh, it's a euro here, a euro there, it quickly adds up. And you're also, of course, getting direct transfers for perhaps maybe a relative that is abroad or far away in a city or maybe you weren't able to go home to get these red envelopes. But now it's digitized and there's no reason not to give these and receive these envelopes as well. Um, and so, you know, once that started, they were able to tap on additional services. So the services, like I said before, like wealth management, um, they can buy plane tickets, book hotel rooms, um, do a lot of other um, mobile payment uh, actions that they weren't able to do before. And it's one of the reasons why this platform has stayed. So I have discovered, after living in China for five years, that there is more security to do online banking in China than I have ever experienced in the United States. There are, I, this, and it's one of the reasons I actually don't have online banking. It, it, it's very confusing as a foreigner to navigate through it because there's multiple passwords. You get a key fob, very much so, like if you're in a high security um, company where you have passcodes that change um, like every like five minutes and you have to input it in and then you have other passwords that you have created for yourself. They verify where you are by sending an SMS as well. So there's many, many points of safety. And because like you said, you know, Chinese people are actually just uh, historically so wary of putting their money in banks. They usually like to stuff it under their like mattresses, put it in walls like you know a couple decades ago, but now they're more willing to put it into banks um, because they have set these um, things in place to ensure that your card is tied. And actually if you connect your bank account and your card to the WeChat account, there is an extra password. There's a password you can set up for your WeChat account very much so like, you know, your Facebook username and password, but then there's a separate pass password that you set when you want to connect your bank card. Um, and of course, other types of verifications as well. You have to put in your, um, your, your ID um, as well as other pertinent information. And like I said, those two examples about taxis um, and Chinese New Year red, red envelopes, they really knew like what would entice Chinese consumers. One, basically free money and then two, facilitating the transfer of money during such an important holiday that that's like one of the key things that you do, um, as well as go back home and spend time with your family. So going back to service. So their strategy is to incorporate as many services as possible to the platform. Um, and one of those ways is to first connect your bank account. Um, and that's why I think that WeChat will continue to be uh, an app that is used um, next year, even in a couple years. It may transform itself into something else, but because it encompasses a lot of your personal and professional needs, it's really that 24-hour platform to power your life. Um, and just recently, a couple months ago, they introduced something called City Services to three cities in China, where you could pay traffic violations, 
You could apply for a marriage certificate. You can make doctor's appointments. You can check the weather. You can pay your utilities. You can do all these different things. So imagine everything that you have to do through a government entity here in Amsterdam that you could be able to do, let's say, example, through Facebook. So, so WeChat has actually officially made an announcement this year that they will pivot from international and domestic expansion and only focus on domestic development and expansion. So they will only focus on the Chinese consumer, um, the Chinese user. And I think it's really smart because most of their users are already Chinese. Chinese people are the number of outbound tourists. They spend the most money out of any tourist in the world as well. Um, and honestly, you know, when people ask me, oh, is WeChat going to become popular? You know, I don't think I can ever use it. I'm like, well, if you want to do business in China, you, you have to use it. And who doesn't, who, or who cannot afford not to do business with China? It's kind of like the, the life that we, we, the world that we live now. Um, and so when you have, you know, most of the people that you would speak to in a business world already on WeChat, you have to use it, right? There's no other way. There's no other platform. And if you don't have it, when you're working in China or even with China, to communicate with Chinese colleagues or clients, you're kind of just like, oh, like, you don't have this? It's like the equivalent of exchanging your WeChat contact information is just like a business card. Mm -hmm. And business card exchange is extremely important in Asian culture and Chinese culture. And now, just within the last like year or two, ah, here's my card. Uh, let's also like like scan our QR code so we can be connected like on WeChat as well, because people communicate through WeChat all the time. You can make phone calls, you can do video calls, um, all types of things through the app. So, and the the, the mm -hmm. people uh, China, mostly Chinese people, but uh, we're talking about the millennials, but they're. Yeah, so it's widely spread. Also, it is very wide, business-wise, it is widely spread. So Chinese millennials kind of like you know, they will always be the most tech savvy. The younger you are, the just the more agile you are on technology, um, and all things internet. Um, but it has become so pervasive that people from all age groups are using it. My grandfather used it. He's like 85, <laughs> and he's he's using it as well. Uh, of course, not as well as like my cousin who is like 13 and using it, but everybody uses it because it's so core to communication. It is how you communicate with your friends, your family, and your colleagues. And there's a lot of um, messages that get exchanged as well, kind of like a, a newsletter of sorts or articles um, that can be displayed within the application as well. Um, so like I said, it's, it's virtually almost everything that you, you, you would want to do, you could do. Uh, within this uh, application. So I'm going to share some real life examples with you now. Um, so Clark's is a shoe brand and they've used their WeChat account to do customer service. So they have a one year warranty on their shoes and if you buy a pair of their shoes, you kind of set up a profile on the WeChat account uh, and you're able to see, oh, well, this is the shoe that I bought. I have eight months out of the 12 months of my warranty left. Um, where can I get my shoe fixed? Where is the nearest store? Um, but also get information about, oh, like what is next season shoes? Um, and also, also ask, you know, oh, I'm looking for this shoe in a size um, 37 in the color red. And someone, whether it's automatic, so a computer can do this, if it's already a programmed response, or an actual customer service agent can reply back and say, oh, hey, like, this store is in, uh, the store that is shoe avail is, is available in is in X, Y, and Z address location. So they've really been able to use this as a very easy customer service platform. Um, and, it's, and a typical WeChat uh, account looks like this, like a chat window. There's a keyboard that you can message people, and there's different menu navigations, usually about us, um, new product information, um, news, stuff like that. Anything that, you know, just kind of like the core navigation you would have even on a website. Um, and messages will come in uh, little boxes like this. Uh, this is an example for DHL. Um, you know, when you when you send and track packages, you know, that's all you really want to do, send and track. But there's so much information on the website. I'm always astounded. I'm like, it should really just be, the website should just be this one block, and it's like, 
do you want to send or you tr or do you want to receive a package you're looking for? But instead, it's like log in here, like here's the news and here's like photos and all this stuff. And so they realized this, you know, and it, it, and there's an opportunity for them to connect better with their customers in China, and they create an account where you can get account information, package information, and and more specifically, so very special is study abroad students. Um, parents have to ship things to them, um, but they also need to ship things to you know the their their college. Um, when they're moving abroad. And so they knew that this was going to be a very popular feature, so they added this um, to the official WeChat account to make people's lives easier. And so, as an example, I could be um, talking to my sister um, who's studying college, um, and I'm like, oh, like she seems kind of homesick, so I should schedule or find a way to send a package to her. I don't really need to leave the WeChat app. I can just go to the uh, DHL official account within WeChat and just like look up all the information I need, maybe schedule a drop-off or a pickup, and that's easy. You don't have to be searching the website, figuring out things, because you know, in some ways like you're like, wow, oh, this seems pretty basic, because it is, because there are only a couple things you really need to do with a brand, like with a service. Um, and if you need to do more, like you'll go on a computer, but you know this is going to be only the most important information that you need. Um, and this is a different example that we've done with Johnson and Johnson, a media relation. So uh, in Chinese culture, uh, the relationships you have are very, very important. So much so there is a term that we use called guanxi, which is basically translated into relationships. Um, and you know when, it, when we talk about media, this is extremely important as well. Um, media, not only your friends, uh, but they're also a professional contacts as well. And they really do like to communicate through WeChat. And so Johnson and Johnson has a WeChat account, official account, um, separate from their general Johnson and Johnson account, um, just for media relations. Uh, where journalists can go and say, oh, well, I have information about this product or maybe this news, um, and input a keyword and get a message back. Um, or kind of like a next step. Oh, if we don't have information about this, please contact this person at this email address or even like this WeChat account. You can message this person. Um, and of course, when there are media events, you can send invites here, track um, event uh, responses. RSV responses, um, but also help them book their travel as well. Um, and sending, of course, like press releases, that information, you can send it through uh, the account as well. Um, one of the cool things about WeChat is that you can send documents through. So I can open um, Excel documents, sometimes PPT documents, it gets a little funky sometimes, but definitely Word doc uh, you can open within uh, the application. So it's very um, easy for recruitment as well. Um, uh, friends are always kind of uh, sending around uh, different job descriptions for various companies or people um, discover new openings at companies. Um, and this is Australia Tourism Board. Um, they have one of the best, I think, official WeChat accounts. Um, and what they do is really play into that whole um, strategy where someone can go to their um, official WeChat account and they'll get a welcome message, and they'll get a list of 10 different menu items, like, are you interested in A, B, C, da, 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 all the way down. Um, and then, let's say I select uh, number eight, which is tourist attraction introduction. And then, da, 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 they'll send more detailed information. So it's kind of like, you know, like a, like a quiz, like, do you want this, do you want that? And you go down, 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 down. Um, and then I select, oh, I want to know about, you know, this one property. Um, and so then I get this really nice multi-media um, message where I can have video, I can have um, uh, pictures once I click in there to read all, uh, to explain a little bit more about the hotel. Um, so it's, it's very interesting and it's very easy to use as well. So it's a lot faster um, than sifting through a Google search and wondering like, oh, is this, do I want this, do I want that? Like, this will give you a general overview of what you can do in a location. Um, and then Oreo last year at South by Southwest, which is a conference in the United States, um, used WeChat mobile payments for people to pay for custom designed Oreos that they made um, at the event. Um, so you scanned a QR code and you were able to pay for um, your customized Oreo through WeChat. 
um, and that's something that they did in the United States to really showcase to all the um, the digerati there, saying like, oh look, like WeChat will be coming soon. This is what you could do, like with your phone, like with QR codes and with mobile payments. Um, and then an example from Xiaomi, uh, which is an electronics company in China, um, and their recruitment on WeChat. They have a separate account purely for recruitment, um, and it's it's a great way to broadcast opportunities. There's live chat sessions, and the navigation bar on the bottom is opportunities, inquiries, um, and then about Xiaomi, about the company. Um, and you can actually interact with a live person and you can send voice messages saying you have questions and they'll answer you or text responses. So it's a great way to streamline people's interests um, in a company because you can also categorize this and organize this in the back end and ex export all this information in Excel um, and versus going through LinkedIn, because we do have LinkedIn in China as well, and saying like, oh, like this job, that job, but here, like it's, it's much faster, you get pushed a lot of information and the most recent job opportunities as well, and friends can send it around too. And this is a really fun recruitment example that I have. Um, it became quite viral. It, it was a Buddhist temple in Guangdong, which is the south, which is a city in the south of China. Um, and you know, there was a, a Buddhist monk, the master there, and he was like, "Oh well, I was just going to post like a regular job ad, but the young monks they told me that was really uncool, and no one was going to apply for these eight open positions." So they hired like a graphic designer to design this like really fun, colorful, um, beautiful ad within WeChat, um, and they were able to get 1.1 million um, uh, impressions and also 4,000 applicants. And it was a very big buzzed about. Um, it wasn't even a campaign, um, just recruitment um, over WeChat, and so much so that the Buddhist temple is like, oh, well, now we're looking for social media people and graphic designers because it seems like people, you know, like this way of communication, and also um, it's a great way for them to spread um, Buddhist uh, messages and kind of what Buddhism is about. Um, so a lot of the monks there use WeChat um, and communicate with people. Um, through WeChat as well. Um, so then talking about global implications. So I've spoken a lot about China, I've spoken a lot about Asia. Um, so what does this actually mean in terms of global trends? Because I think a lot of what we see um, in China, in Asia, is being adopted by Western platforms. Um, an example is in the summer of 2013, Facebook introduced the stickers. Uh, but Line, Kakao Talk, and WeChat had stickers for years before that. Um, Facebook this year introduced uh, peer to peer money exchange in Facebook Messenger. Um, Apple last fall introduced much more, many more robust features to their iMessage um, app as well. And so we see a lot of things in Asia being carried over um, to the West. And even Snapchat. Snapchat has started using QR codes. Um, so for people to find each other with as well. Um, the QR code, I know everyone's like, nobody uses QR codes. Like, everyone really tried to make QR codes a thing, but it never really happened. Um, because I think it's just a generational thing. It's kind of just the, the right place, the right time. It just has to happen. And for some reason or another, um, everyone uses QR codes in Asia. And perhaps, you know, in the next generation, QR codes will be much more popular. Cause you know, when you think about it, it's pretty easy to scan and you get a lot of information because a QR code can link to really anything. It can link to a video, um, to a photo, to a website, a web page, anything. And of course, um, the implications of mobile first. Um, the world is a much more mobile place than ever. Um, and we're really moving away from the majority of the population who use the internet, understanding um, the internet via mobile, uh, via PC, and moving into mobile. So more and more of the population will only know the internet via mobile, uh, that's smartphones and tablets, et cetera. Um, and so we'll see a lot more apps that are just going to be centered around mobile. Um, and that's why we've seen Snapchat, Instagram, all the mobile messengers, and also those anonymous uh, secret applications as well, such as Secret, Whisper, and Yik Yak um, that are mobile and location-based as well. And so that's it for me. Um, I hope that you found the presentation to be interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.